it's great to be together, man. I, I love when the guys get together. I feel like I fight, I fight to preach to the man, the man, because it's, uh, it's one of my favorite groups to speak to. So tonight, I'm going to jump right into it. My name is Matt Rupert. My wife and I, uh, along with Derek McNeil and Shauna Gill, lead the New Jersey Campus Ministry. Let's hear it! Yeah! I heard more, more noise from New York than New Jersey on this. Jersey! Jersey. <laughs> Jersey. Oh, I was like, Jersey. I'm going to honor New Yorkian. Well, guys, so I wanted, to, uh, I wanted to call tonight's lesson Boys in the Hood, oh. <laughs> comma, The Brotherhood. And then I was like, I don't know if y'all know that movie from 1991, oh, yeah, Boys in the Hood. Definitely Instead, tonight we're talking about building a brotherhood. Yeah. Building a brotherhood is something that needs to be built. It's not accidental. Right? Okay. You know, I've been, uh, I just celebrated my 12th spiritual birthday on Monday. Wow. Oh. October 3rd, 2010, I got baptized into Jesus. Okay. And uh, since then, I went to William Patterson in New Jersey, and then I graduated and went into the campus ministry. And at this point, I've now seen at least two generations of college students come through the college ministry. Wow. Right? So from freshman to senior, I've seen two, at least two generations of those kinds of students coming through the college ministry. And I feel a little bit in a privileged perspective because I've seen things go really well. I've seen things not go so well. And I've also seen things just go okay. But I told um, I, I told our Jersey boys when we were at the camp, the Jersey boys, I told my Jersey boys when we were at Camp Hope for Kids, um, basically the same story, so go along with me. When I was, um, when I was at working at camp this summer, um, we were told right before camp started that at 2 a.m. that night, there was going to be an incredible once in a 500 year uh, meteor shower. They said it's going to be amazing. The most beautiful types of meteors that you've ever seen. You're going to go up there and you're just going to watch them shoot and shoot and shoot for hours. Only thing is that it starts at 2 a.m. And so I heard that and I was like, you know what? <laughs> I'm wild. My wife's not here, right? Let's, let's do this thing. <laughs> And so at 2 a.m., 2 a.m. came, and 2 a.m. went. I woke up at 7 a.m., oh, <laughs> and I missed it. I missed the once in a 500 year meteor shower that was gonna change my life. Dude, we all did. And it was, we all missed it, right? It was gonna be incredible, but I missed it because it was inconvenient for me to experience. Mm. It meant that I would have had to get up out of my comfort zone, literally out of my bed, go outside to the cold so I can look north, right? <laughs> I said, no thank you, I'd rather sleep. And I missed out on something so special. In college, and especially here in the campus ministry, God has provided an opportunity for the relationships here to be a once in a lifetime opportunity. The friendships, the brotherhood, the relationships that can be forged here will change your life, will enhance your life. I believe, because I experienced this, that the men in this room, you or men, the men in this space, one of them may be your best man, like Mark was for me. One of them may perform your wedding, like Rob did for me. Certainly your groomsmen are amongst this circle. But here's the deal is the kind of relationships that Jesus desires for us to have through his blood and through the church can be missed if you're not careful. I've seen people leave campus ministry and leave an opportunity for relationships that were gonna transform their life and say, I'm lonely, where are my friendships? I think sometimes if we're not careful, we can miss something so special. And so guys, I want and pray and hope that we experience here and then in the generations to come a brotherhood and friendships that will change our lives. Amen? Amen. Now here's the thing about friendships and brotherhood. There's a, a great scripture in Proverbs 18, 24. And the Bible says, A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. In the campus ministry, we have many companions. A companion is defined as a person that you spend a lot of time with as you travel along. The thing about companions is that they're temporary. Companions are convenient. Companions are always around you. But when you're no longer together, the relationship no longer exists. 
So God says, a man of many companions may come to ruin. But there is a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that's the kind of relationship that we want to forge together. Yep. It's not a group of many companions, which is deceiving. We're saying, I got friends. I got companions. I got people around me that are around me. They are my friends. But my question is, are they your brother? Are they the people that are going to be in your trench right there with you? A lack of intentionality leads to a repetition of what is easiest. A lack of intentionality leads to a repetition of what is easiest. We are going to catch ourselves if we're not careful. If we lack the intention of being connected to one another, we will revert to what is easy. And brothers, companionship is easy. It's comfortable. Your arm's distance, when you're there, you're there. When you're not, you're not. And we keep it pushing. But that's not what Jesus desires for us. He wants to experience something so special. In 2003, on March uh, 21st, my grandfather passed away. He was the first person, or sorry, 2017. Uh, my grandfather passed away, and he was the first person in my family to have passed away. And I remember going to the funeral, and I think some, some of the brothers came there with me. And I remember looking around, and, and honestly, I didn't feel much. I didn't feel sad. I didn't cry. I don't know why I didn't feel sad. I don't know why I didn't cry. But after that funeral, I felt so bothered that I wasn't moved emotionally, that I wasn't necessarily going to miss my grandfather like that that I made the decision right there and then that I would love in such a way that when someone was gone, I would weep at their funeral. I said, I want to live a life where I'm not just passing along next to people, but I want to hold you and know you and love you. And when the time goes for you to go, a part of my heart is going with it. Wow. That's the kinds of relationships that Jesus is offering. And that's not, in many cases, what the world offers. God is offering something so much better. In the Mighty Man of God, a book that many of you, I'm sure, have read and like, Sam Lang says, I decided a long time ago that whatever my weaknesses and flaws are, I would not fail in friendship. A man's life can be measured by the quality and the number of his friends. And while friendship is one of life's greatest treasures and joys, loneliness is one of its most awful miseries. Yeah. I will not fail in friendship. Brothers, let's let that be our conviction tonight going forward. I'm going to fail in a lot of different things, but I'll tell you what I'm not going to fail in. I'm not going to fail in being committed to my brothers. I'm not going to fail in friendships. You know, guys, I believe that what you expect from yourself will determine how you surround yourself. What you expect from yourself will determine how you surround yourself. What does your level of commitment to the brothers around you reveal about what you expect from yourself? Yeah. David had incredibly high expectations. King David had incredibly high expectations of himself. He was bent on being a man after God's own heart. That's a high call. He was competing in the Olympics and he, was, he wanted the gold. He wanted to love God with all his heart. He wanted to be his best for God and to defend God's honor. And guys, he did it. David was known for his great individual feats, right? right. David and Goliath. David was an incredible musician at a young age being called up to play for the king. Right. I mean, that you don't get called to play for the king unless you're good. <laughs> he was a lyricist. He was a lyr he was, I don't want to say he was a rapper, but he was a lyricist. Yeah, yeah he was. Think about it. His songs, oh, aka sick. his songs, hey, have been on the yeah. Billboard 100 for the last 3,000 years. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe you memorize them. What songs do you know from 3,000 years ago? No, I won. David was legendary. <laughs> and he was a man that all of us ought to imitate. But when you think about David, next to him is the name Jonathan. Yeah. Are the mighty men. Next to David is Nathan and Samuel wow. and Solomon and Joab. David, despite being so great, while being so great, surrounded himself with men who transformed his life. You know, brothers, in Acts chapter 2, 
hundreds of years later. It says in verse 44, we're talking about the first century church right after they all got baptized. In Acts chapter 2, verse 44, it says, All the believers were together and had everything in common. Okay? Here's the deal. No, they didn't. They had jack squat in common. The first century church, all these people came from all over Jerusalem. 15 different nations with 15 different cultures, 15 different skin colors, and 15 different languages, you name it. It was such a different group. There could not have been more things different about them. But the reality is that their everything was in common. Hmm. Despite being so different, their everything was shared. David and Jonathan had that. And that's what we get to have too. When God is your everything, that passion transcends all other factors. It makes skin color, hobbies, taste of music, your major, your desired career path. All the things that would be dividing factors in the world, it makes them a secondary concern. When God is your everything, that's all that matters. And you will find connection when Jesus is your everything. Brothers, check your connection. Check your connection with one another. My, uh, my Jonathans are in this space up here. And my hope and prayer is that we all find at least one Jonathan in our life. And I'm blessed to have Mark and Rob and now Derek and John are becoming my Jonathans as well. My, my kind of my right hand man. I love these guys. I would do anything for these guys. And I know they would do anything for me. Time and time again, they've displayed that in my life. But if Mark and Rob went to the same high school as me, you better believe right now that I would not be friends with either of them. And they would not be friends with each other, okay? Here's the deal. Mark would be the long-haired, baseball playing, Troy Bolton energy, sitting with all the popular kids in the corner, right? You have Rob Novak, long hair, grunge loving, popular kids sitting in a different corner with a different group. You'd have me, the video gamer, second class athlete, and intellectual sitting with a totally different group, right? We wouldn't be connected at all. However, because of our love for each other, because of our love for Christ, more than anything else, we've been able to become best friends. I don't like Rob's music. I really don't. Yeah, I really tried. I really tried. I don't like it. I really don't like baseball. I could go the rest of my life and not watch baseball again. But I love these guys and they love me because what is most primary is shared together. Yeah. Guys, okay. do not shy away from what brings us together in the first place. We are here and connected and the basis of our friendships is established because of our love for Jesus. It's the common bond that we all share. And sometimes in an attempt to seem cool and relevant, we focus on the peripheral things when neglecting what is most important. It should be commonplace amongst us to ask each other how we're doing spiritually. How are you really doing spiritually? What are you reading in your quiet times? What are you growing in? What are you struggling with? How can I pray for you? Can we pray together? When we're all about basketball and music and video games and the girl and this and that, all those things. Do not differentiate us from the world. Yeah. However, it will be our shared love for Jesus that bonds us closer than anything the world has to offer. Because yeah. yeah. it is the sole thing that we share together. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Check your connection. Build the collection. <coughs> That's my second point. Now, I'm not saying like, I don't know, collect people and put them in your garage. That's not what I'm saying, okay? I'm saying collecting memories. Build the collection of your memories. David and Jonathan were amazing. They were beasts together. But David also shared amazing relationships with the mighty men of God. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, 
We don't have time to read all of it, but David, it describes the mighty man that David fought beside. And it has a guy that went into a snowy pit on a, on a snowy day and, and yeah. killed a lion with his hands. It's got stories of, um, you know, people grabbing a spear out of another dude's hands and killing him with the spear. I mean, those are some crazy memories. One story that David shared with his men where his renegade boys heard that David was thirsty. Y'all know what happens, right? You guys know what happens? Yeah. yeah. His boys hear that he's thirsty, and so his guys fight their way through enemy lines, get a glass of water, fight their way back, killing a bunch of people, and they go, David, here is your water. And he goes, man, you, I, I'm not worthy. You killed a bunch of people for this. This isn't good. And they pour out the water. I don't know how I'd be feeling, but I'll tell you the truth. Knowing you guys, if you were in that situation, you'd be making fun of David for a very long time. <laughs> that was a shared experience that they had. That was a collection that they were building amongst one another. And because of that, their friendships were established. They were built. You know, I think many of these men were presumably the ones that joined David in the caves after David fled from Saul. These were the dented and discontented but eventually became the mighty men of God. That's the kind of relationships that we get to experience. We get to be dented and discontented, but we surround ourselves with men of God We begin building memories together and we become transformed people. The shared experiences forge friendships that are deep and substantial. We need to prioritize in our relationships with one another. We need to prioritize having adventures and making memories together. Can I get an amen? amen? Amen. If you're with me, this is fun. I told you to have fun at church. Come on, man. I like this. Here's the deal. I firmly believe that Wednesdays, Fridays, and Sundays are essential building blocks for lifelong friendships. I'm unapologetic about that. Sometimes young disciples and older disciples too. Honestly, as is displayed by the men missing tonight, I think sometimes we can view Friday nights as a as a as an event that is more optional than required, right? Well, the Bible's not really being preached in most cases. It's just about fun. It's just about relationships. That's not really like the Jesus thing. Well, that's not true. In Acts two, they devoted themselves to the fellowship. They devoted themselves to the relationships. We believe that our connection with one another is so important that we are sp willing to spend money to rent places and to help forge connection. Yeah. When you see your connection, you not only prioritize Friday nights, but you actually look forward to being here, right? Yeah. I think that's a part of building relationships with the meetings of the body. Yeah. It's such an important building block. However, that being said, I also firmly believe that our relationships cannot be contained solely to meetings of the body. Nice. It's out there in the wild, the unstructured times that the best relationships are formed. That's right. Grabbing food together, going on adventures. Let me just take note of anything that resonates with you here. Grabbing food together, going on adventures, praying together, sharing faith together, going on dates together, hello, sleeping over one another's house, all night video games, random adventures to Wednesdays, Wendy's after midweek. Yeah. You know, I may not remember a midweek from five years ago that Rob preached. However, what I do remember is 25 of us taking over Applebee's yeah. and shutting the place down. Yeah, I mean, it was a crime what we did, okay? <laughs> we got there and we had, I remember so much, 25, we took up, it took like two hours to get in. And then finally, there was a girl we shared our faith with. Her name was Ashley. She was a waiter. And later on, Ashley went on to become a Christian. I will never forget that night. Ask me where Rob's point was in the sermon. I can't tell you. But I'll tell you, I remember that night. <laughs> Deep friendships are a choice, and it costs time. But are you willing to invest? It is worth it. I can say a lot about Rob, and I love him so much. Rob and I have been getting together outside of, of meetings of the body every week for eight years. We have spent over 400 quality times together outside of meetings of the body. Rob has become a great friend to me. 
Derek and I. Derek and I have gone hikes in the wood, woods. Mm. We've gone in some ratchet campouts. We've done four hour drives to Boston one way only to come home that night so that we could get him a date. Amen. John and I, Johnny Boy and I did a 135 mile bike ride in August together. Yeah! Slept on the freezing cold beach in the fetal position, spooning each other, hoping to make it. Hey, man! I mean, it was like, it was a soft spoon. The spoon was together in the pit, you know. It was a Oh man, I'm inspired. I'm inspired by Daniel and Omar's relationship. Yeah. Yeah. Daniel and Omar are like, I don't even know how to say it. It's a brotherhood. It's like a cute married couple, right? I mean, it's like they love each other so much. I got a phone call a few years ago, and Omar's like, Where are you? I'm like, I'm two hours away. He's like, I'm on your front porch. Dar Daniel and I bike 20 miles to get here. Yeah. It's like, what are you doing? <laughs> That's how friendships are forged. Yeah. Friendships are forged in the hard times of prayer. Yeah. Friendships are for, 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 or forged in the deepest and darkest moments. Yeah. Friendships are formed not only on Wednesday night at 7.30, and Fridays at 7.30, and Sundays at whatever time you meet. Friendships are forged on the daily when you're willing to go out of your comfort zone and build memories. Yeah. Build the collection of memories. What are your stories? What are the moments and memories that give body to the bones of your relationships with one another? Start making them. When we end our lives fighting to persevere and bring glory to God, I promise you, you will not remember how many episodes of One Piece you watched. <laughs> Instead, you'll remember the moments, the faces, the memories. Invest in those now. A note about experiences and friendships. Friendships blossom when both people initiate equal. Mm. That is the fertile soil with which we become close friends. Mm. It's hard to have a close connection when initiation is one-sided. Mm. If you're feeling frustrated with where your relationships are at, remember what we said earlier, or I, I was going to read this earlier, but it, the thought that to have friends, you must first be a friend. Mm -hmm. You must first initiate and give and hope that someone will initiate back. That's how best friendships are forged. Mm -hmm. And if no one initiates back, you don't stop initiating. Yeah, that's right. Why? Because you're not doing it for the people. Talk about it. You're doing it for God. Yeah. And so you love and you pour yourself out. The grass is not greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. That's right. Let us build the collection. Yeah. Let's build the collection of memories and connection with one another. Lastly, Bring on the correction. Okay. Mm. Brandon oh. likes this one, I can tell. Uh -oh. Bring on the Talk correction. About Talk about we it. We got David and Jonathan. David and his right. mighty men who were dented and discontented. Mm -hmm. And then you got Jonathan, then you got David and Nathan. Mm. As David, our hero, becomes the villain of the story. Right. He looks out from a rooftop, maybe just like this, into a window across the way. He sees a woman bathing. He goes out, he gets her, and he sleeps with her. If that wasn't enough, he then went and found out who her husband was and said, Husband, come on over to my, my palace. Take this note back to your commander that you're fighting for. And that note said, go on the front line and pull back so he could die. Our hero became our villain. It's hard. This is the asterisk on David's life. Yeah, right. But praise God for Nathan. Praise God for Nathan. In 2 Samuel 12, verse 7 through 10, then Nathan said to David, You are the man. Not in a good way. <laughs> you are the man. 
That is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hands of Saul. I gave you your master's house to you, and your master's wives into your arms. I gave you all Israel in Judah, and if that had not been, if that had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? You struck down your right of the Hittite with the sword and took his wife to be your own. You killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Dot, dot, dot. That challenge that Nathan gave David transformed his life. Psalm 51 follows Nathan's correction. Psalm 51, David becomes a broken man, repents, and is transformed. Brothers, who is your Nathan? Who is the person in your life that knows the good, the bad, and the ugly? Who is the person that you have given permission to come into your private home and say, you are the man. You were impure. You were immoral. You were this. You were that. And allow you in love to call you out and challenge you. We cannot have a brotherhood that is unwilling to step on one another's toes. I said it. We cannot have a brotherhood that is not willing to hurt one another. Hurt one another, Matt. Come on, what are you talking about? Yes. Our brotherhood needs to be willing to hurt one another. This is scriptural. And I'm going to explain what I mean. Proverbs 27, 6 says, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. That brother who is speaking truth to you is not actually hurting you. It just hurts you. <laughs> He's not saying something that's not true. He's not saying something that is mean. He is speaking the truth to you, and it hurts. But that's what a friend does. Whereas an enemy multiplies kisses. Oh, you're awesome, bro. You are the man. You're the man, bro. <laughs> but the real Nathan says, no, you are the man. You are the man that said that you would never do that, and you did it. Yeah. Let me help you out. Yeah. We need to have Nathans in our lives. We need to be willing to speak truth to one another and make it uncomfortable for a little bit. Because that is what is required for growth. Wounds from a friend can be trusted. Do you speak the truth to your friends? And do they speak the truth to you? Guys, I have given my friends an all-access pass. Straight up. So much so that I gave my wife an all-access pass to tell on me to rob. And she does. <laughs> she uses the backstage pass, right? I don't want them to be afraid of challenging me. Instead, I invite it. Brothers, that last point here is bring on the correction. We talked about check your connection, build the collection, but bring on the correction. I think the best question that you can ask the men in your life, if you really want to build a friendship with them, is what is something you see in me that I can grow in? Practice that with you really quick. What's something that you see in me that I can grow in? You ready? One, two, three. What's something that you see in me that I can grow in? Okay. I know it can leave your lips because it just did. Now I want to see you do that to somebody else outside of our time together. You know, when you are not so prickly and not so eggshelly and not so easily hurt that you allow someone to come into your corner and say, bro, here is what I see that you can grow. You don't get defensive, you don't get angry, but you get like David and you go, ah, thanks for saying it. That hurts, but I needed to hear it. Yeah. That is what's going to transform you. I've had friends, I've had really good friends that have come and gone, but I don't really remember their names right now. But I will never forget when Rob challenged his socks off me about my emotional instability. I will never forget when Ross Lippincott 
called me out for being impure as a disciple in high school. I will never forget when Mark and I basically got arrested at William Patterson for breaking onto the roof and the cops came and they cussed us out and they threatened to expel us. Mark said, what were you thinking? You brought our entire family group up there. That was disrespectful. That was rude. God entrusted you with them and you blew it. Man, I remember exactly where we were. And I'm forever grateful for those guys in my life. We need to have the connections. You're not afraid to hear the challenge from them. Amen? Amen? So guys, we're going to land this plane right here. Let me just rephrase my three points. You need to. Check your connection. Build the collection. And bring on correction. This next few months, next few weeks, whatever, this next year, the rest of your campus ministry experience has the opportunity to be the best, most friendship building, the most radical relationship building time of your life. And like the asteroid belt that went over our heads, it will be inconvenient. It will be at times uncomfortable. For my introverts in the building, this is not gonna be immediately fun. But let me tell you, it is worth it. Yeah, yeah. It is everything. It is what we are here on earth to do. It is the heart of God is to love one another and eventually to love our new brothers that are coming in and to demonstrate our love and our sacrifice, our connection, and our friendships together. We're going to close out here in prayer. Our mighty God, We all feel so lonely at times. When we live in the busiest city in the world, we are always surrounded by people, but it is so easy for us to feel lonely. And if we don't feel lonely, we cover up our loneliness with band-aids that are temporary. We go to girls to fill relationships, to fill a hole in our heart that is meant to be filled by the relationships of brothers in our life. And God, we pray that from this moment on, that each of us, that you stir each of us to pursue relationships with the brothers on this balcony, to pursue relationships with the future brothers that will come in, to love them and to bring them into the fold, to, to co collect memories together, to connect over Jesus, to correct one another. God, we pray that you transform our hearts and transform our future. God, I'm so grateful for my friends here. I'm grateful for my companions who will soon be friends. Help us not solely be companions, but be a brotherhood together. Thank you for your promise. Thank you for your plans. There's nothing to pray. Amen. 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 Come on, let's give it up for Matt. Yeah.